Good afternoon and welcome to What She's Made Of 2020. I'm Terry Baer, co-chair of this event and vice chair of the Western New York Women's Foundation. And I'm Susanna Shank, co-chair for this event. It is our honor to welcome you to this very unusual and special edition of our annual What She's Made Of. We hope this unprecedented time has found you and your loved ones in good health and good spirits. We are so excited to bring you this 100% virtual event, and we have an empowering and inspiring time planned for the next 90 minutes. Today, Terry and I stood before the mural of Shirley Chisholm, first African-American woman to be elected to Congress, and who then later went on to be the first woman to run for president. To honor all of the women who came before us to help pave the way for our panel of incredible women leaders who have run for offices at all levels, including New York State Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes. Angie Kennedy, current elected counselor for the Seneca Nation of Indians. Tony Vasquez, former Williamsville School Board member and current Western New York Women's Foundation Board member. And Angela Marinucci, 2018 Erie County Clerk candidate. We will be greeted by special guests who have sent their messages of empowerment from all over the world. We have incredible performances from young women in our community and very special spotlights on some of the unsung female heroes of Western New York. Before we get rolling, we'd like to say a very special thank you to the many people and organizations who helped make tonight possible. First, thank you to our presenting sponsor, m and Bank, for their continued belief in our mission and for being a company consciously working to empower women. To our corporate sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield. To our Crystal event sponsors, the Buffalo Bills, Bank of America, a Phoenix, and Harder Seacrest Emory. And a very special thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters that you can find listed in the Event e-program. We also extend our gratitude to the Western New York Women's Foundation Board, Ameritai Advisory Board, and committee volunteers, including what she's made of, for giving so generously of yourselves to advance our critical mission. It takes a lot of vision and energy to accomplish the breadth of work that we do, and it's guided by passionate volunteers. Here tonight, even though we can't be together, we have women and men from all over Western New York and beyond. You are our strategic partners, our fervent supporters, our fearless leaders, and the inspiration for our commitment to ignite social change for gender equity. Because of you, our Moms from Education to Employment Initiative is helping lift families out of poverty at three local community colleges. And with our new Economic Mobility Hub, families have increased access to quality, affordable childcare as a workforce support. Western New York has gone all in and is embracing the elevation of women into greater positions of leadership to create a more robust and equitable community and young women can see a brighter future. So thank you to each of you for joining us tonight and supporting our work. Your generosity is making a difference in people's lives. Next up, China Ingram. China is a talented performance poet from Dayton, Ohio. She also happens to be brilliant. She just graduated from high school and she will be attending Case Western University on a full academic scholarship this fall. And she's also going to be an aerospace engineer. Take it away, China. Life started six seconds ago. The universe expanded and particles and atoms and science and yeah. This gas is an energy, but no time, no night or day or human life or any insignificant thing that we enjoy. Things were still just gravity, darkness, and potential. There's yet to be a name for the amount of time that passes, but peace is great. Things are quiet and things are going smooth, but it doesn't take long for the universe and what little is a part of it to become bored. So it wishes. Galaxies and stars and planets that might later be called moons are born from the gases infused with wishes. Life already existed, but here is when it begins. Water. Molecules of water surrounded by organisms that later evolve into us mammals. 
humans, things that reproduce and build and question. Centuries go by and there's populations, communities, people. Here we are. Build, expand, build, expand, revolution, families, build, expand, the universe is always expanding. The clock ticks, more elements, more gas, more stars, not enough food. Build, expand, the fight for land, technology. This is the future. Domesticated energy, factories, jobs, money, more people, our clock never stops. This is where we settle down. Stars are still exploding, hands tick, and numbers change. There's anarchy, prejudice, and laws that separate, but life is easy. We accomplish. We build, we buy, we sell, we die, that's life, and it's easy. We build, we buy, we sell, we die, that's life, and it's fast. We're faster than we've ever been. It's easy to do things when time never ends, but then again, we weren't that quick to end laws to prevent colors from being friends, a generation that wished for better. Lynchings like it's Salem, like it's roots, like we don't know how to treat one another because we've never walked in each other's shoes. We're stuck in the past, but God, are we fast? How often do you change the batteries of a digital clock? Life begins and ends in an instant. A blink and you missed it. Mankind should have hit rewind a long time ago. We fought, bought, and expanded, thought time never ended yet. Here we are using resources that'll never be replenished. What happens when we run out of things? Do we make more and run from a man-made sun? Do we mix, match, and kill until we're unified as one? What happens when we run out of time? Like energy, it can't be made or destroyed. But when the hourglass empties, we still beg the Sandman for more. Hello everyone, I'm Kathy Hochul and my heartfelt thanks to my friends at the Western New York Women's Foundation for hosting this event to encourage and support women running for office. I'm delighted to participate virtually so we don't lose the momentum associated with this 2020 celebration of the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. You know, to fully evaluate the state of equality for women in 2020 and what the fight for women's suffrage teaches us today, we go back 172 years this month to a tiny village in the center of New York State, Waterloo, the place for the days leading up to the first ever Women's Rights Convention in 1848. With old, audacious women drank tea and penned the words of the Declaration of Sentiments, modeled after the Declaration of Independence. The document was punctuated with anger and frustration over the sorry state of affairs for women. A fact unknown to many is that a few days later at the actual Seneca Falls Convention, there was heated debate as to whether or not they should even include the right for women to vote because it seemed so radical. It almost went down in defeat. Ultimately, a majority of the 300 present supported the final document that declared that women should be treated equally and have the right to vote. But its release sent shockwaves around the nation. The criticism was fierce and the debate raged on. What I draw from this era, from the women and enlightened men who first proposed gender equality back in 1848, all the way up to the enactment of women's suffrage in New York in 1917 and the rest of the nation in 1920, is that countless strong-willed, committed individuals paved this way. The first suffragists didn't live long enough to see what they fought for actually adopted in the 19th Amendment. Regardless, their perseverance and their belief in expanding equal rights continues to serve as an inspiration as we celebrate this year to mark its centennial. What can we learn from these early activists that is relevant to the unfinished business of today? First and foremost, changing the status quo means this, refusing to accept it. Yes, progress, even if oh so slow in coming, can still stir the soul and give hope. I think of the progress made since I was elected in 2014 as the second female Democratic Lieutenant Governor in New York history, and now as the highest ranking elected female in state office. Since then, I've used my position to take a hammer and help shatter barriers faced by other women running across the state. And when I won re-election in 2018 as the first female Democratic Lieutenant Governor to serve two terms, I was joined in statewide office by Tish James as Attorney General, Andrea Stewart Cousins as Senate Majority Leader, and Crystal People Stokes as Assembly Majority Leader, all the first women, 
all the first black women to serve in these powerful, not long ago male dominated leadership positions. At the federal level, we have Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who followed then Senator Hillary Clinton. The fact that 24% of the U.S. House and Senate are female is at least some progress since it was only 19% when I served in Congress. And our numbers in the state legislature is now 33% female. Women have been elected to executive positions such as mayors of Albany, Rochester, and smaller cities, as well as Nassau County Executive. But under each of these bright lights is still a dark shadow. The fact that women constitute 52% of the population means that we should be 52% of Congress and the state legislature, as well as mayors and CEOs. I reminded a Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg when asked, what's the right number of women to have on the court? She answered, nine. And I'm surely not the only person who's taken note that in Erie County, there is not a single woman countywide office holder nor in New York State's second largest city, the place I call home, are there any elected women. This is where the status quo needs to be shaken up. Programs like this, sparking that interest, stirring the passions of someone who thought running for office was for others, not them. Building the confidence that is so often lacking in women who underestimate themselves, yet will vote for men whose qualifications are far less than their own. And lastly, ensuring women aren't barred from running because they don't have adequate child care. Who's watching the kids while mom the candidate is out campaigning at the local chicken barbecue? That has to be solved collectively by the community and society. Otherwise, millions of young mothers will never be represented by someone who's living the same experiences. This year is the opportunity to recruit and train candidates for the 2021 elections. And I ask women who are debating whether or not to pursue the opportunity to serve and to better live the lives of members of their community, these simple questions. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? The ranks of elected women are growing and the November 2020 election will hopefully be a continuation of that trend with the anticipated selection of a woman as a major party vice presidential candidate. We must ensure that the long battles to win suffrage that we celebrate this year didn't just mean the opportunity to vote. To honor that legacy, it should also mean the opportunity to vote for women. And getting more women on the ballot starts right here with the work of the Western New York Women's Foundation. I thank you for hosting this forum and for working to change the status quo for the betterment of Western New York women and families. Thank you. Imagine being a single parent all alone full-time work, full-time school, no help from anybody, not even your community. My son, he has a disability, he's a preschooler, and it has been very difficult with me finding childcare for him because of his disability. I am trying hard to have a brighter future, not only for myself, but for my daughter. The Western New York Women's Foundation has worked tirelessly for over 20 years to advocate for women. Uh, the Western New York Women's Foundation um, is a data-driven, respected voice in our community, working on issues affecting women. This organization recognizes that one policy can change the lives of thousands of women. There's uh, about 100,000 children in the Western New York region under the age of six. And so we wanna make sure that children um, and their families are supported. So without the Western New York Women's Foundation, who would be speaking up for young children? So we ask ourselves every day, what is the relevance of Western New York Women's Foundation? What happens if we don't exist? And we know that the leading voice for women, for gender equity, and particularly for childcare as an essential workforce support would not exist in this community if it wasn't for this organization. Our work is more important than ever before. As our resources are stretched, to the breaking point during this crisis. It's a very hard balance to try to work from home or if you're an essential worker like myself to go into work and not have childcare. So it's really important that these services are given to the community so that we can make, like, make ends meet. These programs and how far they reach, they're not just reaching you know, young women, but they're reaching like another generation on top of this one. 
The challenges that I'm facing right now are difficult, but they're not unique. And the Women's Foundation is working to help to make those difficulties a little bit less severe. I am one of those parents that have benefited from the Western New York Women's Foundation. And we know that policymakers and decision makers are much more apt to listen when we are united in our voices and particularly those who are contributing to the region's success are a part of that and a part of that movement. We know that it will only have really positive benefits for young children. And we know that the influence that we can have over systems change, and particularly policy and funding being driven to our region, would not exist if the Western New York Women's Foundation did not exist. It's the Western New York Women's Foundation and the SPRE program that are helping women like me. The person that you're investing in uh, today may be just the person who solves and makes a big problem for us. Your support means we can keep pushing forward to make life easier for women in our community. Good evening and welcome to the Western New York Women's Foundation, What She's Made Of. We are so excited about you joining us this evening. We need your help to continue the critical work that we do at the Western New York Women's Foundation. We are asking you right now to help raise the money we need to continue supporting, empowering, inspiring women in our community. Tonight, the Joy Family Foundation and I, Paula Joy Reinhold, have pledged a matching gift that will double your donation for our women's economic empowerment work up to $20,000, and we're gonna knock it out of the park. Your dollar and my dollar go further when we do it together. Together we're building collective power to change lives in Western New York. Now is the time for us to stand up for women and girls. Giving this year is incredibly easy. Just click the donate button on your screen or scan the QR code with your phone. The online form only takes a few minutes and your support is greatly appreciated. So thank you to every one of you for stepping up to support the efforts of the Western New York Women's Foundation to ignite social change for gender equity and empowerment for girls and women. Hello, I'm Kim Campbell, former Prime Minister of Canada, and I'm very happy to be here to give my best wishes to this wonderful program, encouraging women to seek public office and raising the resources to make it possible for them to do so. I held elected office at three levels of government in my country, the municipal level in Vancouver on the school board, the legislature of British Columbia, and then in Ottawa, where I served in the cabinet of the government of Canada. I was the first woman to be Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, so I became responsible for legislating the criminal law. As a woman, there were many ways in which I wanted to reflect that novelty of the first woman Minister of Justice. I convened a national symposium on women, law, and the administration of justice that was in many ways quite revolutionary and initiated all sorts of very interesting legal initiatives. I also revised the sexual assault law in Canada. My bill became known as the no means no law. Uh, not only did it define what consent was, but it also defined where as a matter of law, consent for sexual activity could not be found. It is still a very important piece of legislation in the Canadian criminal law. I was the first Canadian woman to be uh, Minister of National Defense. In fact, the first woman in a NATO country. Uh, and then I went on to become leader of my party and we were government and I became the prime minister. All of these things were, were challenges for me because in many cases, because I was the first, nobody who looked or sounded like me had done that job before. So there's always a challenge of establishing the normality of somebody new and different doing a job. But 
many women have done it. And I am a founding organize, uh, member of an organization called the Council of Women World Leaders. We are over 60 women who are or have been president or prime minister of their countries. Increasingly, women are getting the opportunity to lead. And as we've seen in the latest uh, COVID pandemic, the countries that have been the most successful have very often been those that have been led by women. So it is no longer an issue of whether women have the capacity to lead or the capacity to make a contribution in government. They've proved it all over and over again. Every bit of research about women's leadership capacity shows that they are as strong as men. But this is not always taken for granted. The other thing, of course, is that no one woman can represent all women. Among women, there are huge variations, whether it's women of color, women uh, of, of, uh, of immigrant origin, women of different, different regions and different perspectives and different interests. So we need many women. Until we actually have gender parity, we won't come anywhere close to having the kind of voices necessary to make sure that our governments speak for all people, and that includes women. So when you think about running for public life, remember there are a lot of different choices, a lot of different levels of government, but that it really matters. Women can do it and democratic integrity depends upon the diversity of voices that go in, not just to making decisions, but identifying what the issues are to begin with. An American woman politician once coined the expression, a woman's place is in the house. And that's very true. I hope you'll go for it. Thank you. Western New York Women's Foundation is proud to partner with Oxford Pennant to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote. Oxford Pennant has created nine special edition hand-sewn Votes for Women pennants inspired by historic suffrage banners. Want one of your own? Visit our website to donate and enter for a chance to win, now through August 26th. searching for ways to connect. We long to be part of a group we believe in. A group that helps define who we are. This is what it means to be part of a community. At m and Bank, supporting all the important communities our customers are part of is nothing new. 
to enable, encourage, and empower people and communities to thrive, there's nothing more important. Welcome to the 12th anniversary of What She's Made Of. My name is Andrea Vossler, and I am the board chair of the Western New York Women's Foundation. At the foundation, we are principally focused on building and supporting women leaders and helping women and girls become economically self-sufficient. Tonight, we are thrilled that you can join us for an incredible evening that highlights one of these key missions, saluting women in leadership. There has never been a more important time to encourage female leadership. As many of you know, women leaders are collaborative, compassionate, and inclusive. With their focus on working together, women leaders can have collective impact. And by joining us tonight, you help our foundation lift more women into positions of leadership by funding our important work. Funding our work helps us make a difference in the lives of women and girls in our community. Tonight, we are very proud to welcome a panel of incredible female leaders to what she's made of. These women have run for office because they care about their communities and want to roll up their sleeves and help. Our panel tonight is incredibly diverse. We are featuring women who have run for office at the state, local, municipal, school, and tribal levels, and across all political parties. They have inspiring stories to share and their personal experiencing are empowering examples of how each of us can make a difference. Tonight also celebrates the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women across the country the right to vote. It's our responsibility to honor that sacrifice and passion and exercise our rights this November. Now it is my honor to introduce you to Morgan Williams Bryant, the moderator for tonight's panel. Morgan is an incredible dynamic and accomplished leader herself. She's a 2003 graduate of SUNY, where she graduated with a degree in broadcast communications. And then she earned her master's in organizational leadership from Madai in 2006. From there, she started her career in the Youth and Family Services Department of Erie County and quickly rose up the, the ranks to become the Deputy Commissioner for Erie County's Youth Services Division. Morgan joined the Girl Scouts in 2013, where she currently serves as their Chief Impact Officer. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you all for being with us this evening, and we hope you enjoy the program and to continue to support our organization and its important work. Thank you. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is such an exciting time for us to be having this conversation on the heels of Senator Kamala Harris being selected as presumptive Democratic presidential nominee, Joe Biden's running mate. Today, I have the privilege of highlighting our local women who are trailblazers it's important for young and seasoned women who hear these to hear these amazing stories of courage and why we celebrate the centennial of the women's right to vote. I want to bring and talk about my few my five girlfriends that are joining me today. First up is Crystal People Stokes, who was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. She worked briefly as a school teacher before Buffalo before working for the Buffalo Urban League and Citizens Action of New York. People Stokes went on to serve the Erie County Legislator from 1993 until 2002, being appointed as Majority Leader in 1998. Angie Kennedy currently serves as an elected counselor for the Seneca Nations of Indians. Voters in 2018 elected her to the 16-member Seneca Nation Council for a four-year term. Her other hobbies include competitive basketball and playing with her grandchildren. Angela Marinucci ran for Erie County Clerk in 2018, losing the general election by 1.2%. A former corporate immigration lawyer, Marinucci now serves in the Polling Carts Administration as a special assistant for personnel in the Erie County Personnel Department. Elizabeth Rankin is a legislator in Chautauqua County. She previously worked at Boston University and St. Bonaventure University. She also currently works as Chief of Staff for New York State Assemblyman Andy Goodell. She lives in Jamestown with her husband Tom and son Wallace. And finally, Tony Vasquez is the chief systems, chief of systems, excuse me, for Greater Buffalo 
United Accountable Care Organization, co-owner of Urban Family Practice and co-founder of the Raul and Tony Vasquez Foundation. Previously, Mrs. Vasquez was elected to the, U to the Williamsville School Board. Mrs. Vasquez is a philanthropist and inspirational leader for aspiring business professionals. Please welcome the five young, lovely young ladies that's joining me on the panel today. So we're gonna start off with a question for everyone. And first I wanna say special thank you to all of the panelists for sharing with us today, but also for giving so much of themselves each day to serve our communities and sometimes thankless positions of leadership. You each serve as a role model for the women, girls who will follow. So the first question I would like you all to answer, and we'll start with Ms. Vasquez. Why did you run for an elected, elected position and were you specifically asked to run and by whom? Thank you for having me this evening. It's an honor to be part of this panel with such lovely women along uh, by my side. Thank you, Morgan. Yes, I was inspired. I wasn't specifically asked because the person that inspired me most to run for office was Barack Obama. <laughs> so he didn't ask me. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in 2008, I'm sorry, in 2008. And so in 2009, I decided to run for office. I just, I couldn't believe that he accomplished such a feat, such a feat. And I was inspired beyond measure. So I said, you know what, if he can be president of the United States, surely I can do something here in Williamsville. And Absolutely. so <laughs> I ran for the Amherst Town Board. That was my first, my very first election, which I lost, but that's okay, because I went back. But, um, but yes, that was my first election and my, I mean, my first campaign and my, my very first inspiration was Barack Obama. And great inspiration to have. Thank you for that. Angie Kennedy? Yes. Oh, uh, why I ran, um, we don't have very many uh, women sitting on our on our uh, council. There's only five of us currently. And even before I got elected, there was four. So we're still like a minority going on on our, uh, our council of 16. So mm -hmm. I felt inspired to run because I felt like it was time to change up some things, you know, in my eyes, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mostly dealt with uh, sports, drugs and alcohol on my territories and stuff like that because I used to work for one of our uh, drug and alcohol programs and I felt like we weren't doing enough so you know I felt like I needed to put my voice somewhere where I feel like I would do more things um no uh no one asked me to specifically run I just went out there and said I'm gonna run for council and that's about it <laughs> That's, that, that's really good. You had to encourage yourself to go out there and do it and make a difference. Um, Elizabeth Rankin, can you answer the question? Why did you run for the electric, elected position and did anybody inspire you? You're, you're still on mute. Uh, there we go, how's that? Yes. I had lived away for a while and when my husband and I moved back to the Jamestown area, I really wanted to find a way to give back to the community where I grew up. And a friend of mine, um, a colleague of mine, ran for county legislature and won. And I thought, let's combine those things, a way to give back and to run for county legislature. And they needed more women. So right now there are three out of 19 legislators. So we need more. But I'm, I'm very encouraged that those of us that are there are. Um, my colleague who I said ran before is now assistant leader. We don't have enough women leaders there like in the state legislature. So um, I, I'm proud to be there and do it. They didn't ask me at first. I offered and they had a man who was going to run. And when he didn't win the, the re-election, they came back to me. And as you all know, it's hard to find people to run for office. So when they identify somebody who's interested, they'll come right there and say, would you run? And by that time, I was very excited to do it. So thank you. But pattern with our first three panelists of no one had to tell them they were inspired themselves, took the courage and got out there and did it. 
That that's awesome. Let's move to Crystal People Stokes. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be on this panel with such powerful women. It's good to see you all. Uh, it's been a while, Morgan, since I've seen you. It's good to see yes. you. Hello. Congratulations on your constant rising. <laughs> thank Don't you very much. Yet, though. Say, I, um, I see that. I'll be honest, um, people did ask me to run because I had no desire. I was not interested. Uh, it just wasn't in my thought process at all. But it just so happens that a, a long-term incumbent county legislator was retiring. And it was kind of sort of like the year of the woman around that time in the 90s. And so people were like, well, you know what, maybe, maybe you should run. I actually was a community activist already. I did a lot of work with Citizen Action. Uh, notwithstanding that, I did a lot of work prior to Citizen Action. And so I really had a good network of connectedness to people and to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, you didn't really run in Buffalo unless the party said, we choose you. Well, the party didn't choose me. But since I had already been asked and had decided to say yes, when the party said, well, you know, she would be a great candidate, but you're not the one we select. And I was like, well, okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your time, but I'm going to run anyway. And, and I won only by 25 votes at my do, but I won. So um, I, I, this wasn't where I was going in my life, but sometimes, you know, when Stan God's will, he'll lead you to where he needs you to be. And that's how I got here. Right. I always say when someone tells you no, they're setting you up for an even bigger yes. So the thing. <laughs> yeah, that that's a problem. That I, I don't take well to no. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I just figured I should ask a different way. <laughs> yes, there's another way. <laughs> All right, Angela, the question on the table is, why did you run for an elected position? And were you specifically asked to run? And by whom, if so? I was asked to run, but not by the party or um, people in politics. I had moved back to the Buffalo area about five years before I was practicing law. And a friend of mine knew they didn't have anybody running for county clerk. And as I was legal and I had always been super interested in politics, I lived in DC for about seven years and I felt pretty passionately. Um, at the time I had, uh, my youngest was five months old and my two oldest were um, three and four. So it was wow. a little bit crazy. And when I brought the idea to the party chair, he was like, this is not for you. It's a countywide race. It's a lot, um, you know, I was still nursing. I didn't have much of a network in Buffalo politically. And he was talking about fundraising and all of these other things, but I had gotten the idea in my head and I had been really excited to do it. Um, and there were great leaders in Erie County, female leaders, um, the majority leader, the chair of the legislature, um, even Lieutenant Governor Hopewell, who had shown the way that women could be powerful in Erie County. And I knew I wanted to do it. And I said I could, um, it was a little crazy. You know, my youngest was, I towed it around with me everywhere. I was still nursing and I was going to make it work. And um, and we did. And so it was a hard fought campaign. I'm really proud of how how well it went, but um, still, you know, a tight race is a tight race. Right. And so that's a prime example, especially for women today who we still juggle a lot that, you know, your current circumstances or any barriers that you think is in front of you is not a reason to back down and say no. So thank you for sharing that story. And thank you for running even with a five month old and still nursing at the time. Um, so show of hands, how many of you ran for an elected position, elected office unsuccessfully the first time? So we have, have three here. Uh, Angie, you told us prior that you ran for Seneca Nation Council three times before you were elected. What did you learn in a process and how did you, how did that change your approach? Uh, well, the first year I ran and I ran 2014, our elections are every two years. So 2014, 2016, and then 2018 when I actually was elected. Um, yeah, it was... It was nervous. Um, I'm pretty sure Angela probably felt that when you said, yep, I'm going to do this. And, you know, and you got to go out and create the support and get people to, uh, you know, believe in you. And that's, you know, so the first year was, okay, I'm just going to throw my name in the ring and see how well I do. And uh, the reason I ran in 2016 is because I did fairly well in 14. I was kind of surprised with our numbers and stuff like that when you vote. And then it's just like, Oh, well, that's not bad. So 2016 did the same thing, went out and, you know, tried to get um, more people 
to believe in me again. And uh, also, you know, I did a lot of uh, community volunteering, so they got my name that way. And and you know, just being involved in stuff like that. So so in 2016, when the numbers came back again, I thought, well, you got to. Right, here's the thing about this: is that the numbers really mean something because in the nation election, when we run for our um, party caucus, we probably have like close to like 19 candidates. So you gotta, yeah, so you got to figure if I came in the top five, you know, out of four or the top six, you got to <laughs> change somewhere. And so, absolutely. So I, you know, so you know, when 18 came, you know, I I took it. I stepped it up and took it a lot serious and just went out door to door, made made every event I possibly could, you know, sp spoke to people I've never spoke to in my life, you know, and, and uh, you know, us Senecas are pretty tough on our, uh, our elected officials. So, you know, you got to be ready and you got to, you got to, got to have very thick skin. So, and, and, you know, and I'm pretty sure the ladies know, like even your constituents uh, the same way, you know, so. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, a lot of barriers were that um, I was new to the game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had to like learn it. So now that we're up to our elections again, now I can watch the seasoned politicians and see if I can catch something for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good, good. And Angela, you too ran for county clerk and lost a tightly contested race. Why was it important to put your whole self out there for this race and how would you characterize the camaraderies on the trail amongst other candidates male or female um it was important i think especially in 2018 and in general you know people are seeking authenticity in who they're electing male and female and whoever it is that they want to vote for and so um I didn't know how to do anything else. I, you know, I can only be myself and who I am, you know, I, when I feel passionately about something, I work really hard at it. And I, I love the race. I ended up loving campaigning. Um, I met incredible people all over our county um, in areas that I didn't typically go for, go to before um, running. I live in Grand Island, which is north of the city. And um, I met some of the people on this panel through my campaigning and um, just being out and about and seeing different things and what there was to offer. I was incredibly blessed to be surrounded by um, a slate of candidates who were um, powerful and exciting and, and really wanted to help each other along. Um, it was the governor and lieutenant governor were up for a re-election in 2018, um, as was Tish James was running for AG. And, you know, they were going around um, in Buffalo often, the Lieutenant Governor was a huge sense of support every time she was in the area because she had formerly been Erie County Clerk, as she mentioned in her video. And after she had left in 2011, there hadn't been another county-wide female elected official. And so, um, but it wasn't just women. There are a ton of great male electeds and people who were running. I was running along with assembly candidates, um, Pat Burke, who was running for the assembly at that time. And it was his first election to that role and he took me around with him in his areas where he was a legislator um he helped me out he he walked around with me um i was running with a judicial candidate who was also doing countywide and she and i would check calendars and i would you know speak with people staff members who would help me out on events they were going to um it was it was powerful and it was exciting and i made mm -hmm. life like it completely changed my life i before this was practicing law firm I loved and um you know now I'm in the Poland Cars administration and I'm I'm working hard and I feel very proud of what I'm doing. And so um it was a huge turning point. I, you know, the it's hard to lose. It's very, very hard to lose. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. So I'm gonna go oh I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you froze for a minute. Okay, there you go. My computer froze for a second. Okay, so I want to move on to the wisdom of our panel, which is Assembly Women, Assembly Woman People Stokes. You have been a public servant for a long time, first as an educator, then a county legislator, and since 2003 as a state assemblywoman. Not too long ago, the New York State was governed by three white men in a room. And now as Lieutenant Governor Hoko noted, we have three elected black women leading. Tish James as Attorney, Ge as Attorney General, Andrea Stewart Cousins as Senator Leader and yourself having 
been elevated to a position of majority leader of the New York State Assembly in December of 2018. Tell us what it has been like to be a part of this enormous sea change that has been defining and the defining lessons you've learned. You're on mute. We tell you, it's very humbling, very, very humbling. I um, was bitten to run for office when I was told no. So I ran for the county legislator, I won that. And then I ran for the, the um, state assembly and the first race that I ran there, I didn't win. But uh, the next time that gentleman just decided that he was not going to run again. So I did win. That was as far as my desire was to go. Uh, I never even conceived of being the majority leader. It never even crossed my mind that I would end up in a position of majority leader. And so to get there is very humbling. Uh, it is, also speaks volumes about um, my ability to create census and, and bring consensus around issues because um, there are 150 people and 105 of us are Democrats in, in the state assembly. We all come from a different place. We all represent a different region, but basically we all really want the same things for our constituency. Sometimes it's hard to get people to that when they think it should be only their way or only their legislation. And so uh, my skill set is you know, that of building consensus. I grew up between two boys, I always say this, one brother younger, and one brother older. So I was always in the middle of, you know, shuffling through that to make sure that I was always winning. And I did. And so I, you know, I, I bring these exact same skills to being uh, the majority. Leader. And I think that's why I was selected. I don't think I was selected at all because I'm an African-American woman. Because as the uh, attorney general said earlier, and you mentioned it, um, Andrea Stewart Cousins was already made uh, the leader of the Democrats as an African-American woman. Uh, Tish James had already won her position uh, as the first attorney general to be an African-American woman. So I wasn't selected because of that. I'm, I'm confident because I sh I'm sure there was a lot of pressure on the speaker. Well, wait a minute, now, now haven't we done enough with these African-American women now? I'm sure he got that conversation. Uh, I actually got it. Well, you, you, you won't be the one considered because we've already done this and we've done that. Um, so, that's not the reason I'm here. I'm here because I bring that consensus building skill set. And I treat people like I want to be treated. Um, it's not important to me that you like who I am or what I say. It's important that you respect me the same way that I'm going to respect you, whether I like Absolutely. who you are or what you say. Absolutely. And that is the, the wisdom that brings me to where I am. And I count that all as glory and I always give God all the glory because that's where it belongs. Thank you. Thank you for that wisdom. So this is a question again for everyone. And I'm going to start off with asking Tony Vasquez, why do we need women in elected office? Why go through the trials and tribulations? Well, you know, I'm a consummate practitioner of the old adage, to whom much is given, much is expected, right? And we as women have been given an extraordinary, unique opportunity to break glass ceilings at the same time simultaneously pulling it, you know, go, reaching back and pulling our sisters with us and uh, and paying it forward. So, you know, just Shirley Chisholm, like uh, Mrs. Hochul, Lieutenant Governor Hochul suggested earlier, Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman to serve in Congress. And she said it this way. She said, I'm not a candidate of just Black America, although I'm proud to be Black and American. I'm not the candidate of the women's movement, although I'm equally proud to be a woman. I'm a candidate of all the people and my presence symbolizes a new era of American political history. And so I, I, I live on those words and I live with that adage, like we are here for a purpose and we have such a unique opportunity as women because of our strengths and because of the experiences that we have to make it better for all of our constituents. Awesome, awesome. Elizabeth Rankin. Why do we need women in elected office? Well, I um, I don't know if the wisdom is people Stokes who said you grew up with brothers. Um, I grew up with brothers and you have to learn how to fend for yourself. Um, and it helped me be able to learn when to sit back and listen and when to come in and ask questions uh, because they're all rather boisterous and I was always kind of the quiet one, but I, I see 
um, I like to watch people and see what they need and what they're all about. And I find that women have an extraordinary ability to do that, to read into, to read other people's hearts. I think we have a heart for helping, a heart for serving. And I think that not just women, we need more women, but we need lots of different perspectives and um, diversity in, in our legislature and our elected officials. And I'm really happy to help move that forward at the local level in Chautauqua County. Thank you. And Angie, why do we need women elected in office? Because women rule. Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> um, I, I really view, you know, like going back to uh, even my own culture of uh, Had the Haudenosaunee people of Longhouse, you know, the women ruled the house. We were the clan mothers, you know, we chose the chiefs. So, and, and we settled the disputes. So, you know, I mean, just looking at, you know, the way my culture set up, you know, we need more women because we look at them as the caretakers, they're fair, they're honest, you know, and that we want, you know, I, I would like to see more women, you know, run for office. You know, I, I've been up to Crystal's office a few times, you know, and it's just, it's just nice to see a woman in power like that, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I just feel that women are, they make a better decision. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and while, while I have you on here, Seneca women were not given a right to vote until 1964. How do you as an indigenous want, uh, leader encourage other Seneca women to vote, especially since it took so long to secure that right? Well, you know, I kind of want to clarify that a little bit. You, you're right. We didn't get the right to vote until 1964. But our constitution wasn't written until 1848, so a little history there. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, they were still trying to work out, you know, um, so women never had the right to vote when the U.S. Constitution was written and stuff like that. So it, in 1920, they did make a push for it to um, try to get the right to vote. Uh, however, it got defeated. So 1964 was when it finally, you know, passed. And they did many uh, referendums. But when you got an all male voting, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was pretty tough for them to get that passed until that, until that time. Um, so right now to get other women to vote, actually um, majority of our, uh, majority of the eligible voters are women. And um, I, so the way our um, po political system set up, you know, in politics, uh, you see more women involved with, uh, uh, going out and getting who they feel should be elected. They, you know, the matriarch always, you know, you visit the mother it, when you want to go visit the family. Mm -hmm. So there's always a matriarch and you talk to her first, then you go, you know, and then you can talk to the rest of the family. It's kind of interesting that way, you know, and I, I mm -hmm. like it that way because you learn things from the, from these women, you know, mm -hmm. who are much older than me and lived through a lot more than I have. And, you know, so you get a nice education out of it. So I believe our women are, you know, they're, they're out there voting. So yeah. as you said, women rule, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tony, you served your community through the school board. What is one of the defining lessons you learned in this process of running or serving that office? It's hard to define just one lesson because I served in that capacity for six years and I was president for one of those years. So I, I learned a lot of lessons during that time, but unequivocally and undoubtedly, I must say that I learned the potency of my own strength, you know, because like, you know, Whitney Houston, the great late Whitney Houston said in the song, she didn't know her own strength. I didn't know my own strength, but when I was elected to the position and I had to go to the trials and tribulations of being one of um, nine members in a voting capacity and on a voting block. And a lot of those times I was a sole person voting on one issue and other people did not. So that, and that was fine because I stood my ground no matter what I was going to stick to my, to my values. And, and, and I decided that I would not be swayed by my other board members, which I wasn't. But so, so the potency of my own strength has to be the biggest lesson that I learned. It was very difficult because I was a sole, I was the only African American woman on, on the board at the time over the course of six years, and there hasn't been one since. So 
you know, it, it's difficult. It was difficult, mm -hmm. but I'm stronger because of it. Yeah. There, there's a quote that I like that says a, a, a woman don't understand or know how strong she is. A woman is like a tea bag. She doesn't know how strong she is until she gets into hot water. And a lot of times, you know, we understand, we, uh, we learn through um, the decisions and the positions that we find ourselves in that we're stronger than we think we are. Absolutely. That, that, that's a great lesson. By the way, there was an Eleanor Roosevelt quote. Yes. Yes. Yeah. One of my favorites. Yes, me too. <laughs> okay, so this is another uh, question and we're coming up on the end. So I'll say um, you can answer the question in six, 60 seconds or less. The reality of running for office, especially for women, is there are many hurdles in running for office. What is the worst thing, most outrageous thing that happened to you on a campaign trail? You keep it clean, but you can make us laugh if you want to. <laughs> so I'll start with Elizabeth. You need to have um, good shoes, and um, because the you know I keep thinking about slipping on the wet leaves, slipping on the ice, um, falling down the stairs. You know when people when I'm talking to people, looking like a total klutz. Um, but you uh, you keep going, you keep smiling, you pick yourself up, and oh, and encounters with dogs. I bet everybody's run into that. You know the the dogs in the neighborhood. Yeah, those are some of the hurdles. A good one. Who doesn't like an excuse to buy new shoes? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Angie? Uh, I guess flubbing over my words is always a hurdle for me. I mean, even today. But uh, so those are, you know, those are the thing is uh, being yourself and, you know, not trying to be all made up before you go to doors. I found that out a lot. <laughs> Just be natural, be yourself, yeah. be able to connect to the people. That's good advice. <laughs> it's simply woman, people stokes. Well, I would think the some really, I never did a dog house, first of all. If I thought it was a dog <laughs> there, if I saw a sign, if I heard a dog, I didn't go there at all because I love <laughs> the spirit of dogs. But it was really striking to me when I literally heard this lady ask somebody, because we did a door to door campaign, put up a lot of signs all over the place. And she said, just who are these crystal people? <laughs> really not getting that it was my name was Crystal Peoples. She's like, who are these crystal people? So, kind of funny, and we we kind of laughed it off, but she she got it afterwards, and she voted for me too. Oh, that's good. I like that. And and last, Tony. Um, that's interesting that Crystal that you said who are these crystal people because when I was on the campaign trail I wore my own t-shirt vote for Tony Vasquez and people would come up to me all the time and say who is he who is who is he, who is he? I, you know my answer was he is me he is me <laughs> I'm Tony Vasquez and I'm running for office please vote for me so um but the uh, during the trail of, of campaigning, I, I loved campaigning. It was difficult at times, but I wouldn't trade it in for anything. I, I, I loved meeting the people and I loved shaking hands and, and getting to know their stories and trying to be an advocate for their concerns. Good, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move into um, some questions from our audience members here. So the first question that we have, and this, this is for any of the panelists that want to jump in and answer. When a woman, when woman, when women are serving together on an elected body, do you see women being more interested and able to cross the aisle to work collaboratively with other women in an elected body, regardless of party affiliation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Angie? Well, we're the minority in our uh, panel on our 16 here. So yeah, we, <laughs> we're definitely, you know, reaching out to each other and, you know, working on whose ever strengths those are. Okay. What, what advice would you give for someone who is not experienced in that collaborative work on how to break that barrier down? I'll start with Tony. Just listen, you know, you have to do a listening tour. You do your walking tour because you're walking out and shaking hands and knocking on doors, but you have to really listen. So the, uh, that listening tour is very, very important. Okay. So our next question, and this is for any panelists again, what would you say to someone who might be interested in running for office, passionate about the community, but so disillusioned with the system that we're reluctant? 
Go for it because you, it's, it's a lot easier to fix the system from within than it is from without. That's great advice. Anybody else want to answer to take that on? Elizabeth? I would, I would um, make sure that you're, you're talking to people to find out what's really important to them. Even if you're disillusioned with the system, sometimes it just takes that one next person to try to break through a barrier. And so like Crystal said, just go for it. You, you never know when you're the one. Um, get your support systems behind you, even if you feel like the system is broken. Build your relationships in your team. So it's not just you, it's a group of people coming together. And, and don't forget your family, you gotta get your family on board. But if you can build that alliance with friends and people in the community, it's a lot easier to face a system that you think is broken. I call that the circle of success. Every woman needs a circle of success around her. Right. We have another question. I have a 15-year-old daughter. Do you have any advice regarding how I can introduce her to the process and encourage her strength? Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. I would say, um, you know, if she's 15, you should allow, if you have an opportunity to go to PTA meetings or any sort of leadership meetings, you should take her with you. Um, you should allow her to experience the opportunity of where people are sharing their opinions and coming up with a consensus on how to move forward with an agenda. Um, and you should allow her to maybe uh, have some leadership skills uh, within the household uh, that, that she chooses that she'd like to do. And maybe you should even encourage her to run for student government. Okay. Elizabeth, I see you have your mute off. Were you gonna to speak to this one? Um, sure, we, we have a 15 year old son and that's exactly what we do. We bring him along everywhere to meetings, to volunteer organizations, to have him help with people in the community and on campaigns to hand out literature and say, you know, that's my mom. And she's really just to get the opportunity to talk to people to see what that's, what that's about, including them in and let them feel part of something. Great advice. Okay, here's another question for any panelists. Do you specifically try to recruit women to run for office as you did? If so, what are you looking for in the women you identify as possible candidates? Well, I'm reminded of my former colleague in the county legislature, Joan Bozer, who says, I'm always looking for a woman who thinks like I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm not so sure that that's even necessary because, you know, um, I used to serve as the chairwoman of the uh, Legislative Women's Caucus, which is bipartisan and bicameral. So um, to me, it, 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 it doesn't matter. I think I can work with anyone who um, has the same level of appreciation and respect for the golden rule that I do. If you just treat people like you want to be treated and have an open conversation, open dialogue, things are going to be fine. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Tony or Crystal specifically. Where do you think women's voices are missing or needed most in the local politics? Where is the place to start for someone thinking about making a difference? Well, I think that any elected position is the place to start. You know, when I first was interested in running for politics and, and, and um, being inspired by Barack Obama, I sat down with Satish Mohan. He had been the town supervisor for the town of Amherst. And he said, why are you running for school board? You should run for town board. So he encouraged me to run for town board at that time. But, you know, and, and I did run and I had a great race, but I didn't, I didn't, it didn't end successfully. I lost the race, but I was inspired by that race and, and going through the process. And I thought I ran a, a great race, um, but it, it, it encouraged me to go further. And then eventually I did go back and run for the school board and I did get elected to the school board. So I think that anywhere your voice can be heard is where you should be, is where you should be. Great advice. I'd agree. I was encouraged to run for the school board when I first ran for the county legislature. Well, why don't you start with the school board? Well, because I'm not interested in the school board. <laughs> and so I think women should, you know, run in the areas that they're interested in. Keep in mind that if you run for the legislative body of government, you're going to serve with other people and you have to have the ability to convince them to believe what you believe in order to get anything passed and or done because you can't it's not like the executive branch where you can just say, okay, we're going to do this. And then we have to go get the legislative to agree with it. And the legislative branch, you got to get 
50 plus one to agree with whatever your position is. So it's not as easy as some people may think, particularly um, your average community activist really just thinks I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna change the world, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And really you're not gonna do that unless you convince the other 75 people in, at least in the state uh, assembly to agree with you because that's what mm -hmm. you need to pass something. So um, I, as long as you feel this strong about a position you wanna run for, it should not matter what level it is, whether it's school board, county, city, um, federal or state, you should just go for it. Great advice. Here, I, I have to take this question. Girl Scouts is in it. Shout out to Girl Scouts of Western New York. What experiences, thank you. What experiences did you have as girls that helped cultivate your leadership skills? The majority of women in elected office were Girl Scouts. Yes, I was a Girl Scout. So what leadership skills that you have as a girl that helped cultivate your skills today or put you in these positions? Um, well, you know, they like the question before, what should I do? My 15 year old has some desires. The Girl Scouts is a great place <laughs> to <laughs> learn how to work with other people, hear other people's opinion, express your opinion and come to some con consensus on what the agenda that you all may be working on, whether it's selling cookies or, you know, arts and crafts. Uh, so I, I think those sort of things are, are good. Um, the other thing that really grounded me is my parents raised us in church, uh, St. Luke's African American Methodist Church. So the same anxiety that I have now when I public speak, I had that anxiety when I was five doing my Easter speech at St. Luke's. So, but you learn how to, you know, do these things in front of people because of the way that you were raised. And again, um, it, it's the kind of upbringing that I wouldn't say it prepared me for leadership because I didn't think I was going that way, but it did prepare me for leadership uh, and uh, it gave me everything that I need. And so I think, you know, just church, Girl Scouts, structured organizations where kids are, you know, uh, treated like people and allowed to participate, um, I rose my hand when I was in school, elementary school, I didn't always get called on by the teacher. In fact, mm -hmm. I was told by my guidance counselor that I wasn't college eligible, but because of the way I was raised, I knew I knew better than that. So mm -hmm. I could just hear those things and get right by it. So uh, it, it depends on, you know, the, the, the way you're raising your children or what they get offered in adult life. Reminds me of Michelle Obama's story when her guidance counselor told her that she wasn't good enough to go to Princeton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It happens all too often. Angie, you want to highlight any leadership skills that you had as a girl that helped you today? Uh, sports, lots of sports. Um, uh, you had mentioned I was a competitive basketball player. You know, it that just shows you, you know, someone you needed a team leader. I still do that with uh, my team. Uh, I know it sounds really odd that you know this age and still playing competitive basketball, but that's what we do in uh, Indian country. We play res ball, so we travel all over. So yeah, that's where my leadership skills came from was playing uh, organized sports. It's really good. It really helps you learn how to work with other people and teamwork at an early age. Oh yeah. And, and Crystal, I identify with, with what you said, faith is my foundation, but my mother would sign me up for Easter recitation speeches every year. And I would be like, oh my gosh, is she going to forget this year? But no, nope. <laughs> but I've learned over the years that taught me at that point that even though you're scared, do it scared. You know, the fear may never go away, but you got to overcome it and just do it scared. So the next question, and this is for all panelists, what is your advice to someone who is not from the area who wants to run, but is always told you don't know enough people here because you're not a Buffalo native? Well, uh, I think that person should get busy because um, in order to win an election, you have to have people to get to know you, know your work, feel confident that you're going to be able to deliver something for them and their community. And so if you haven't been here long enough to pull together a base of people who could start you out, you should just get started because the longer you wait, um, the longer you'll be before you get into office. There are any number of organizations that folks can get engaged in that you can start your base out with. Uh, you can start with black clubs. Black clubs are very uh, formative in, in Buffalo. 
Um, there even, even is a, a citywide block club organization where you will get to meet everybody in every neighborhood, make it easier for you to do your door knocking, which maybe you'll get to that one day. We're not going to be able to do that now. <laughs> um, but you've got to, you know, get yourself grounded in, in some base where you have a, a group of people who will work with you to move whatever your agenda is forward. I don't think it matters where you came from, because if you think about it, our mayor, who, in my opinion, has been one of the best mayors we've ever had in the great city of Buffalo, he's from Queens. He came here to go to school and he's still here. And quite honestly, he's, you know, managing through very difficult times and doing a good job of it. So um, I'm not so sure where you came from has anything to do with whether or not you could be elected somewhere. You just got to get started working on it. Get started is the key and build that, build your base, that circle of success me. around you. Elizabeth, I saw you unmute yourself. Yes, I was going to say something very similar. I, When we first moved back to town, I didn't want to run then. I joined an organization that helped, um, a women's organization that helped raise money for needy kids in the town. I got involved in my church and was very mm -hmm. busy there, met a lot of people. I was singing and um, met a lot of people there but also being out on the campaign trail, helping other candidates. I met a lot of people and helped got to know people in the committee. And so I love what Crystal said, get busy mm -hmm. and build your base. That's the best advice. We have about two minutes left in this section. So say in 60 seconds or less, how, did you, how have you reframed your definition of failure based on your years in service? And what advice might you share on how to fail forward? Hmm. Well, I don't really know failure. Um, I haven't gotten everything done that I would like to get done in the legislature, but because I'm still here, I'm going back there. I don't see failure yet. I like that. Uh, Tony? I agree with Crystal. I, I, don't, I, I don't put failure on the radar. You have to speak it into existence, right? So don't speak that into existence and that shall not be. You know, you have to remember, you know, Martin Luther King said in his final speech, he did the drum major speech, don't remember me for, you know, the accolades for my Nobel Peace Prize for all the awards that I won. Remember that I lived my life trying to save somebody. Remember mm -hmm. that I tried to do my best for humanity. I'm a drum major. So be a drum major. Remember that and pass that on. You know, Shirley Chisholm put it a little bit more simpler. She said, I would like them to remember Shirley Chisholm as having guts. Shirley Chisholm has guts. So have the guts, have the guts to stand up for what you believe and do it with the, with the fortitude of, of, of anyone that else, you know, do it with the fortitude of grace, but do it and do it well. Okay, we have about, say, 45 seconds, Elizabeth. I was gonna say when I, I've had my experiences with failure to do it with be gracious and respectful so that whatever happens, you're not blaming other people. You learn what you can from your mistakes and to um, acknowledge the good things that you have or that you accomplished, what you learned from it. Okay. We, we have one question that just came in. We answered this quickly. I'll toss this to Angie. What advice do you have for women who are trying to decide whether to quit their jobs in order to support their children's remote learning? We have about 15 seconds. Oh, goodness. That's a tough one. Um, you know, I hope that the schools are um, supportive of, of what's going on with this COVID if you got to do the remote learning. Um, I don't encourage anyone to quit their jobs, of course. And uh, I, I just know that, you know, even here, people are trying to figure out what to do. And, and until schools can totally figure out how they're going to do it, you know, I, I don't encourage it. But, you know, I, I wish her the best and keep up the strength and don't give up. Thank you. So I want to thank each of you for being so open and sharing your various paths with us today. I want to thank the Western New York Women's Foundation for hosting this amazing event and these panelists where the community can hear from our local trailblazers. Michelle Obama said, you may not always have a comfortable life. You will not always be able to solve all the world's problems at once, but don't ever under and underestimate the importance you can have because history has shown that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. So for everyone that's participating today, these ladies have left each of us 
with increased courage and hope for the present times and future. I wish you all a great evening and enjoy the rest of this week. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies. only, Live Love Buffalo is donating 20% of their proceeds from Empowering Women t-shirts to the Western New York Women's Foundation. Order online at livelovebuffalo.com. The women of Western New York are strong, passionate, and incredible. Tonight, we celebrate them as the unsung heroes of Western New York. Women like Angeline Benbenek, nominated by her daughter, Mary Ann Coulson. As Marianne tells it, I grew up in and around Fort Bragg, North Carolina. My father was overseas, often serving as a Green Beret during the Vietnam War. When my sister and I were old enough, my mother started working on the base for civil service in the supply division. She was responsible for taking care of us, ensuring we were receiving a good education, managing the household, and all the finances. She dedicated her time to her family and her career. My sister and I were very fortunate that she was an exemplary and dedicated role model for two young girls. Women like Latrice Myers, nominated by her Aunt Kwanzaa Humphrey. Latrice is the owner of Let's Talk Western New York, a wife and mom of twin boys. She recently added her voice to the pursuit of positive birth outcomes for women of color. Women like Marilyn Solomon Ward, nominated by her colleague Nancy Langer. Marilyn has been a teacher for over 40 years. After graduating from college, she returned to her grade school to teach and has been a positive influence on children in Buffalo Central City her entire career. Today, Mrs. Ward is the lead teacher at the Nativity Miguel Middle School St. Monica campus. Visit the Western New York Women's Foundation Facebook page to view a full gallery of all the incredible women of Western New York. Thank you to each and every one of you for what you do for our community. Casa Azul is celebrating Women's Equality Day on Wednesday, August 26, with a special promotion benefiting the Western New York Women's Foundation. Dine in or take out any order all day to support our critical mission.
We would like to extend the sincere gratitude of the Western New York Women's Foundation for joining us tonight. Your support allows us to do our work to make Western New York a better place for girls and women. A special thank you to our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to share their experiences and stories with us and to encourage us all to step up. Because this movement doesn't end here. Now it is all of our responsibility to get out there and make our voices heard. We need to pledge to vote. We need to encourage the exceptional women in our communities to run for office and support their candidacies when they do. And we need to lift our philanthropic support of organizations focused on gender equity like the Western New York Women's Foundation. To help you take these next steps, we're pleased to provide you with the 2020 Voter Education Guide, which each of you will receive by email after this event. This valuable resource is packed with information, reminders, and questions that you can ask elected officials before you vote. We're also thrilled to announce our keynote speaker for next year's What She's Made Of, Carla Harris. Carla Harris is an incredibly passionate advocate for women in leadership and is vice chairman, managing director, and senior client advisor at Morgan Stanley. She is also the author of the best-selling book, Expect to Win, Show Up With Your Best Self Every Day. She is also an accomplished singer, performing sold-out concerts at Carnegie Hall and releasing several albums. So mark your calendars for May 17, 2021. We'll see you there, hopefully in person. Hungry after the show? Women-owned restaurants Coco and Savoy are partnering with the Western New York Women's Foundation tonight only to donate a part of their proceeds to our critical work. Go online to order a delicious meal or a festive cocktail delivered straight to your door. We hope you enjoy supporting these women-owned businesses and have spirited conversation over the meal about the program you just attended. Thank you so much for your attention, time, and support.